Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Kristen Kane, and I am the uh, project director for Huyo Ko'olau Poco. Um, our organization, if you're not too familiar with us, we are a nonprofit based in Kailua, and we focus our projects on all throughout the Ko'olau Poco district and other areas when we're asked as well. Our main project type is ecosystem restoration, but we also work on low impact development projects. And those can be things like um, retrofitting parking lots and utilizing different landscaping features to capture and infiltrate stormwater runoff before it has a chance to get into our stream systems and out into the ocean. Of course, my, my favorite part of our projects are our large scale ecosystem restoration where we get to, you know, drastically transform invasive landscapes back into native habitat for fish, birds, um, and reintroduce plant species. And those project sites are really the ones where we get to interact most with volunteers, which is a huge part of why I love doing what we do. Um, uh, I've been with the organization since 2008, so quite a while now, and our organization goes back even farther than that. We got our start as the Kailua Bay Advisory Council um, under a consent decree with Aikahi Wastewater Treatment Plant, and after the consent decree had been expended to other smaller researchers and, and through small grants to community organizations, our board didn't want to just kind of fold and for Kailua Bay Advisory Council to disappear. So we decided, the board decided to incorporate and become a 501c3 nonprofit known now as Huyo Ko'olau Poco. So that's how we got our start. And we've expanded our work from beyond citizen water quality monitoring to our, our larger scale ecosystem and low impact development projects now. Thank you, Kristen. And then with us today is our guest, um, wildlife biology, Lindsay Nittman. She, um, she managed Ndofa's efforts to restore habitat of endangered water birds in Kawainui. And over the past 12 years, Lindsay had worked across the world studying tropical birds and she earned her doctorate in 2018 comparing forest birds, nesting ecology in the Mariana Islands and Australia before starting with DOFA in 2019. So thank you so much for joining us this morning, Lindsay. Can you please tell us a little bit about your work, DOFA's work in Kawainui and your day-to-day -day, uh, responsibilities? Yeah, so DOFA manages state wildlife sanctuaries, forest reserves, the state trail program, the hunting program, um, so we do a lot. Um, I'm part of the wildlife program at DOFA and you know our mission broadly is to conserve and restore habitat for our native species, which in Hawaii we primarily focus on native birds. Um, and my responsibilities are managing restoration projects in Kawainui Marsh, which is the largest remaining wetland in the state of Hawaii. Um, so day to day, um, my job is pretty varied. I can be working on anything from grant writing to, you know, get funding for new projects or continue existing projects. Um, sometimes I'll be out there, you know, driving a tractor or a marsh master to actually create habitat. Although I also supervise um, our field crew who does most of the um, heavy equipment operations. I also, you know, I'm out there finding nests and monitoring nests, doing bird surveys. Um, interacting with the public. Um, yeah, so broadly, I'm working to create habitat for um, three species of native wetland birds, the Ale Ula, Ale Keo Keo, and um, Io. So Hawaiian Gallinule, Hawaiian Coot, and Hawaiian Stilt. Yeah. Awesome, thank you for that. So a little bit of overview of Kawainui. So as Lindsay mentioned, it is um, the largest wetland in the state uh, with over 800 acres. Uh, Kawainui means the great water and Manawili, Kanaiki and Kapa'a stream all drain into the wetland. And it is not only important native bird habitat, but it's also of very cultural importance to the area with multiple heiau. Uh, the most well-known is um, Ulupo. 
and there are multiple other organization, organizations and cultural sites that are working throughout the area. A little bit of history. So 6,000 to 4,000 years ago, Kawainui was an open marine bay, just like Kaniohe Bay. That's what you can see on this, um, this old map to the, to the right. And then 2,500 years ago, a sandbar was built up and Kawainui became a lagoon. And 1,500 to 1,200 years ago, um, there's evidence that Kawainui was one um, of the first areas where the Polynesians settled and they built a 450 acre fish pond with mullet and ava and also a uh, well-designed uh, taro fields or lo'i in the area. In 1800s to 1900s, Hawaii got a uh, Western introduction and uh, Kawanui um, was converted to rice fields and water was diverted for sugar plantation and non-native plants and animals were introduced uh, this all led to sediment buildup, and then in 1966, the 1 1.3 mile levee that goes through um, Kawainui was constructed, and after flooding in the late 80s, it was uh, actually raised, and that construction was done in 1997. And in 2005, Kawainui was recognized as a Ramsar wetland of international importance for its historical, biological, and cultural significance. And in this year, in 2021, in January, we started HOKs and DOFA started this awesome uh, partnership. Um, does uh, Kristen or Lindsay have anything to add to that? Nope. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then uh, Lindsay, can you please um, give us a little bit of a project overview? Yeah, definitely. Um, so a few years ago, I guess 2019, I applied for this grant from the North American Wetlands Conservation Act, which is a federal program that provides money for wetland conservation um, all across the country. Um, and we got the grant, you know, I'd been impressed with the HOK's work at Kaha Gardens and Hiiya. So um, in writing the grant, I had been really excited about partnering with HOK. Um, and yeah, so basically the project is to restore small areas um, along the levee, which I've identified as having high potential um, for water bird um, habitat. So basically, these areas have water year round, which is, you know, obviously very important for water birds that um, there's year round water. We manage a few sites, um, Mauka in Kawanui, that dry out in the summer, and management there is, is really difficult. Um, so, yeah, working with the community and HOK, we're restoring these four sites along the levee. And HOK's role is going to be to recruit community volunteers and get out there in the mud um, and hand pull invasive weeds. Um, and we're hoping that we can create, you know, mud flats, open water, and um, an assemblage of native wetland plants that will attract wetland birds and um, hopefully encourage them to nest. Um, and then I guess a part of the project that we're not talking about, but that the community might be interested in, um, Sana, if you could put your cursor over that kind of triangle area. Yeah, so DOFA is going to be working to restore this area that Sana is highlighting. So we'll be using our amphibious machines called Marshmasters and getting in there. And um, this area right now is covered in invasive bulrush, um, which water birds do like to use, but they don't use it when it's not interspersed with open water. Um, so we're going to get in there, create more open water, and hopefully that area will turn into somewhere more like Hamakua Marsh, which is further down Koinui Stream, um, which is, you know, just a, a hotbed of water bird activity, one of the most dense, um, densely populated wetlands in the state. So that's the goal. 
Yeah, and I'll add a little bit to that also. So um, you can see the four areas that are highlighted on the map that SANA has. We've been working already since the beginning of the year in our site one, so that's highlighted in red. And that is the only site that is on the Mackay side of the levee. And it's also closest to the Kaha Garden or Koinui neighborhood park end of the levee. So you may have seen us working at that site already. We've also been working at site two, which is on the Malka side of the levee. Can you highlight that one, Sana? Site two, oops. <laughs> Site two, we've been working there as well. Um, so if you've been out and the photo, we've got two more sites, site three right there in the corner and site four all the way against Kailua Road. And um, so we'll hopefully be diving into those in the next couple of months, those two other sites. And when I say dive in, the work is pretty deep. <laughs> Sometimes we really are out there in our waders up to our waist uh, or, or chest in the water. And the photo that Sana has on the left there is of Project Site 1. And I think this is a good lead in to our next couple of slides that talk about the plants in the area. So you can see on the surface of the water is one of the invasive plants that we're going to be working to remove. And that is the water lettuce. Um, but this area was identified by Lindsay as being good bird habitat because it does have so much open water on either side. Um, and then the bulrush in the photo along the edge, I guess the middle, um, between the two waterways is the native bulrush as well. So it's a very ideal site to restore. And we've had good success already in hand pulling the water lettuce. All right, Sana, I think next slide is plants. Yes. <laughs> so we're starting off with our um, some of the invasive plants that um, that we have been working on, um, that we have found in those little pockets you saw on the previous slide. Um, Lindsay, do you want to just tell us a little bit maybe um, about these plants and what, why we want to remove them? Definitely. So when I think about habitat restoration, um, you know, some people have this, this view of like, oh, anything that's not native is is bad, um, which, you know, working in Hawaii, we deal with so many non-natives that I try to think about, you know, kind of prioritizing them. And these six that are shown on the slide are, um, they're all very prone to, to just taking over and forming what are called monotypic stands or areas where there's only this one plant. Um, so they're, they're very aggressive invaders. Um, Whereas other non-natives, you know, like millet or barnyard grass tend to be less aggressive and water birds actually use them. So I try to kind of prioritize, um, you know, does the plant provide nesting habitat? Does it provide forage or food for these birds? Um, does it just totally choke out all other native plants? And all these kind of fall in the, the not so good um, category of ranking. Um, so the two in the, so the one in the top left and bottom right, um, water lettuce and water hyacinth are floating invasives. So they grow just on the surface of the water. They float and then just drop their roots into the water and get all their nutrients from water. Um, and they're, in my opinion, from what I've seen so far, kind of the the like start of Kawainui turning into solid land. Um, so they come in, float on the water, and then, you know, they're decomposing and regrowing. Um, so there's kind of like buildup of potential like organic material in the water that then other plants can come and grow on top of them. And then it seems like over time, then we just end up with this accumulation of dead plant material called peat, and then, you know, other invasives growing on top. And from what I've seen, that seems to be how Kawainui is filling in, at least one of the, the, the ways that Kawainui is filling in. So, and they're actually, they're pretty, I don't know, maybe uh, HOK would disagree, but they're pretty easy to remove in the grand scheme of, you know, 
versus digging out umbrella sedge. I'd say they're pretty easy. You pick them up, put them in a bucket or in a boat, haul the bucket or boat to shore and dump them out. Um, so in terms of prioritizing restoration areas, I would say that these two are, are great to target, water lettuce and water hyacinth. And then once you've removed them, you have open water, as long as you can keep le water lettuce and water hyacinth out in the future. Um, so it's, it's kind of low hanging fruit, um, in my opinion. Um, and so most of the project areas along the levee that we're working in, we're removing these two plants. Um, we're also removing cattail and umbrella sedge. Um, in that grand ranking scheme I was talking about before, both umbrella sedge and cattail do have some value in terms of um, uh, ala ula and ala keo keo will nest in them, um, but they're also prone to just taking over areas. So, you know, the goal of our project is to, you know, remove them and hopefully introduce some native plants that are able to somewhat compete with these two, um, these two plants that are, the native plants will be less prone to just taking over an area. Um, California grass, I think is probably one of the worst invasive plants in wetlands in Hawaii. Um, it has no value in terms of food or nesting habitat. And it, it takes, just totally takes over. It sends out runners. Um, and I was talking earlier about the mats of water hyacinth and water lettuce. Um, we've seen at a few of our um, project sites along the levee that California grass will send out runners and you know, start taking over areas that are covered with water hyacinth or water lettuce. Um, so yeah, California grass is public enemy number one. It's, it's difficult to get rid of as well. Um, you know, if we go in and try to cut it with one of our machines, any little fragment that's left can grow roots and, you know, regrow. So we have to be really on our game with California grass. Um, bulrush is also fairly difficult to remove. Um, it, it does, like umbrella sedge and cattail, provide nesting habitat, but when it gets too dense, um, the birds don't use it anymore. So, and it, it drops a ton of seeds. It can also propagate from, you know, little pieces of the, the underground, um, the rhizome. So, yeah, Kristen or Sana, do you have anything else to add? You guys have spent a lot more time out in the mud um, digging up these plants, so you might have a, a bit of a different perspective than me. Yeah, we have some video to show, um, some time lapse video to show a little bit later of one of our volunteer work days at the marsh so far. So that might give people a good idea of just busy bees working to go out and collect the water lettuce. Um, we haven't worked in any of the water hyacinth areas yet along the marsh, so I've yet to interact with that plant. Um, but the water lettuce is really easy to do when it's just floating out on the water. You, we just walk out with a bucket and you're just picking and putting in your bucket, little harvesting. But in the photo that Sana's put up for us, you can see that layer of peat that's starting to accumulate. And when the areas that we're working in have accumulated that dead biomass, it's a, there's a chunk of dead, decaying, funky stuff underneath and it's very odd to work in an area where it's got that layer of wannabe soil I guess we could call it that that's growing um but the nice thing about the water lettuce I guess good and bad it it's got tiny tiny little new shoots and new sprouts that'll come off of it and grow and they hide really well in the umbrella sedge and the bulrush that's out there so we can do a really visually impactful job in a half a day by going out and collecting the water lettuce, but it does take multiple times going back to make sure that we've got all the little ones that are hiding in, in the area. So we continue to go back once a month or so, and granted we've only been working in this area since the beginning of the year, but starting to get a good pattern and a good feel for how often we need to check in on areas. Um, and kayaks have been really helpful in some of the sites too to be able to get across the deeper areas and and get into some of those nooks and crannies where the tiny water lettuce is hiding 
And when it comes down to removing the cattail and, and the umbrella sedge, it's bending over into the water, arms, arms deep with a sickle or a shovel, and you really do just have to dig down and get those big root balls and the root mass out. And the cattails are all connected by rhizomes running underground. And they're fairly thick white rhizomes too for the cattails. So it's tricky to get to get all those out. Um, and we worked on a big chunk of California grass a couple weeks ago and that took all afternoon to get the California grass out because one runner of the California grass can be, we probably had 20 foot long runners of California grass. So all different levels of ease of removal to, I want to pull my hair out, working with this, it's taking all day to do one clump. So um, I think our next slide will highlight some of the native plants. Yes, the beauties. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about um, maybe like the prevalence of some of these within the marsh and what you've seen even, I'm curious, I've never been into the interior of the marsh either and what the plant community looks like in the interior of the marsh too. Um, yeah, so I, I is, um, it, it kind of, it forms a mat, um, which is, I think, good when we're talking about um, kind of hands-on restoration where we're out there, you know, pulling non-natives and planting natives. Um, I, I can actually function as like weed control in that it's um, just covering areas of exposed mud and hopefully preventing some of those non-native seeds in the seed bank from germinating. Um, it's prevalent kind of at the margins of the marsh. Um, it doesn't do very well in deep water. So areas where um, like, you know, mud flat is meeting water, that's where, you're, where you'll find I. I. Um, all three species do use it for nesting. Um, it doesn't really have too much food value for the birds, as far as I can tell. I've seen Ale Ule eat it on occasion. Um, Neke, actually, if you when you get out into the center, Neke fern is very prevalent in certain areas. Um, it's interesting when you're, you know, driving the Marshmaster out into the center and you get to an area of Neke fern, and you know, you're cruising along in the Marshmaster and you start to like look out to either side of you, and the whole marsh is just like undulating um, because so much of the marsh is this floating mat of peat. It's it's totally trippy. The first time I was out there, I was like, I'm like, I don't know. It's like, it was like vertigo. It was, it was super trippy. Um, so Neki, you know, does really well on the floating mat. Um, I have never found a nest in Neki, but my guess, just based on the structure of it, that it would support a nest really well and it would probably do a pretty good job camouflaging. Um, so Ale Ula, I guess we can talk about nests later on, but um, they'll kind of, Ale Ula and Ale Keo Keo will kind of build their nest in amongst a bunch of stems. And Neke definitely has that structure. So I think um, it will, it would support a nest. And I'm really excited to see some of these areas that we're working with HOK to restore along the Malka side of the, of the levee have lots of Neke in that area. So it'll be interesting to see um, if the birds do use it. Um, Ahuava is a really uh, great plant in Kawainui. I don't see it growing really at all in the center. It's, it grows along the levee and in areas where people have propagated it. And I've seen it come up just in the native seed bank and in certain areas as well. It does kind of like drier areas, so not real deep water. You'll see it kind of growing on the edge of water a lot. Um, and in terms of its value for native birds, it provides nesting habitat. Um, we actually found a nest uh, in Ahuava at our first community work day at the end of March um, along the levee. Um, the seeds are used by water birds for food. Um, so it's kind of, you know, doubly um, good. Um, uki or sawgrass, there's just vast areas of the center of Koinui that are uh, covered in uki. And the, the forage it provides is really good. It has um, bigger seeds than ahuava, so just more nutrients for birds. Um, I suspect they, they might nest in it. There again, I've never um, observed a nest because we don't do that much work in the center of Koinui. Um, but we do have some, I think, a few patches of uki uh, 
kind of adjacent to the areas we're restoring for this project. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, and then um, the native bulrush. So it actually, to the, to the untrained eye, it looks fairly similar to the non-native bulrush, um, but it grows uh, much more sparsely, which I mentioned earlier is you know, better for the birds because they can get in there and forage amongst um, the stems and also they can put their nests in there more easily. Um, if you're out in the field with us on a work day, we're happy to show you um, the difference. Uh, it tends to be, the native bulrush tends to be shorter. The seed heads are kind of just less vigorous looking. Um, they drop way fewer seeds, which is probably one reason that they're outcompeted by the non-native bulrush. And then the most distinguishing characteristic is that the stems are round all the way from um, the water to the top, whereas the non-native bulrush, the, the stems are triangular at the base. Um, so it's actually, when you get right up next to a non-native and a non-native and a native bulrush, it's actually pretty easy to tell the difference. Yeah, anything to add, HOK? In site one, um, we do have an active nest, am I correct? Yeah, I checked on it Thursday and the eggs were gone. Mm -hmm. um, so no longer active. Um, okay. It's interesting. Usually when I check all I ula nests and the eggs are gone, I get this you know, sinking feeling. Like, oh, no. But the chicks are very cryptic for, you know, up to a week. They kind of will just hide. Um, so... Yeah, I think it's it's too soon to tell whether or not it was successful. Um, and but, that was, yeah. and that nest was in a clump of ahuava. Yeah, yeah, cool. exactly. So, yeah, okay, that was we'll, cool. We'll keep our fingers crossed and we'll see if we see, look for the babies. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Sana, what do we have next? Yeah, that's actually a really good transition because um, next is the Alai Ula. So we have already talked a little bit about its nest. Um, and yeah, but uh, Lindsay, do you want to tell us a little bit more, maybe um, their seasons and when they lay nest? Um, and yeah, just any fun information about the Aleula. Yeah, definitely. So the Aleula is a subspecies of the common gallinule, which occurs um, in North America. So not a full species, but it is on the endangered species list just as a subspecies. Um, so Aleula, they, compared to the other two water birds that we'll be talking about today, they don't move around very much. Um, they're, you know, pretty sedentary. They stay on their territory, whereas the Alaikeokeo and Io will fly around, um, you know, even within a day. Um, they lay between, we've seen nests of like probably three to eight eggs, um, and yeah, when the chicks hatch, they're um, precocial, so they can swim, you know, within hours of hatching, and their parents do feed them for about seven to eight weeks. Um, so you'll see, you know, chicks with their parents, and even when they start to look like, when the chicks start to look like adults, they're often still hanging out with their parents and begging. They have this kind of high pitch, like, whispering, screeching sound um, that will often tell you that there's chicks in an area. Um, yeah, any, do you guys have any questions for me or is that kind of... That I just have a question. How long does it take um, once they lay the eggs for them to hatch? It's about three weeks. That's all, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's such a short, it's such a short time frame, but it's around the same as like a chicken egg too. Yeah, um, yeah. I, we, like, have, mm -hmm. we have we um, have the Kawanui Marsh is my backyard, okay. and we have um, maybe a couple pair of Alaiula that hang out a lot. And there's this pair recently that they've been trying to um, nest, like from the beginning of this year. Is there a certain time that they nest, or do they whenever? That's a good question. Um, there have been nests found in pretty much every month of the year. Okay. From what I've seen, they tend to initiate nesting after a big rain event. Rain. 
Um, so typically more in the in the wet season and the winter months. Okay. Um, I, I just noticed that this one pair, um, they haven't been very successful, I don't think. Uh, usually we have one of the inlets, the water oh, okay. inlets, okay? Yeah. Um, and so we have uh, some grass growing along the edges. And so they usually nest inside, closer to the bank. But for some reason, this pair, they've been nesting at the outside of it and building really, really big nests, bigger than I've seen before. And, um, but then was during the big rain too. And so the first, the first one, I'm not sure if it, it I think she abandoned it because I, I saw eggs and she, she never came back. Um, huh. But I just noticed uh, this, past week, um, a couple are the building actually two nests along okay. the other bank, but the Aoku'u has been really aggressive at checking them out. Uh, so yeah. we've been trying to chase it away, but um, so just three weeks, okay, I'll just try to keep an eye on them and see how they do. Thank yeah, you. Definitely. Yeah, it's hard. Um, you know, I mean, predators are obviously a problem for nests, including native predators like the Aoku'u, um, but flooding also. We've had, you know, this winter, a lot of, you know, big storm events. And, you know, so there, there's one, you know, one storm and, and everyone starts nesting. And then there's another, you know, storm the next week and the nest will actually flood. Um, so the eggs will often just float away um, or the, you know, embryo will die if, it, if the egg sits in water for too long. It's interesting that you notice they're building bigger nests on the, the edge of the stream. Um, I'm wondering if that was kind of like, you know, a decision the birds made to kind of elevate their nest more out of the stream. Um, yeah, it's, we've also it's, seen- It's very ahead. different, very different yeah. because the, they're, the, the pieces of leaves that they're getting, I mean, it used to be like smaller, but now, it, it kind of looks like a Lalhala basket, oh, built, yeah. you know, it's weird. It's really weird. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite big too around in diameter. Yeah. Yeah. They're, building, they're building their raft, so. Well, <laughs> yeah, but so the nests will, will float um, to, to some extent, obviously if they become, you know, if they're not as buoyant as the, the water, you know, as the water level is, they, they'll start sinking, like the, the materials become saturated, but yeah. you know, they, they do kind of function as rafts to some extent. And we've yeah. also seen birds, you know, it's raining and the water level's rising and the birds will just be like, you know, trying as fast as they can to bring more material and build their nest. Yeah, up, they've, been do they've been doing that this yeah, past couple months because of the rains, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we, yeah, well, you know, we have a lot of them yeah. nests back here for, the, for years and that have been very successful. You know, yeah. when you see the babies all the time. Yeah, I and always, so, those, those yeah. inlets, I see chicks there frequently. Yeah, and that's why I was, uh, I was wondering because this year when they're nesting, the nests were different and I haven't seen any babies yet. So I don't know, I don't know if the Aoku'u got them or um, there's mongoose back there. Yeah, yeah. there are, and, I think, plenty of mongoose. Um, yeah. Yeah, then they've been checking them out too. Yeah. Yeah. One thing we use, um, we don't use these along the levee just because it's so public and we're worried about theft. Um, but at our sites, um, our restoration sites that are closed to the public, we use little um, action triggered cameras. So basically, these cameras will take a picture anytime. Unfortunately, anytime, you know, grass moves in front of the camera. Um, so we, uh, my interns end up going through a lot of grass photos. Um, but also, you know, we do get photos of mongoose, photos of Aoku'u. And at least on, on the Maka um, side of Kawainui, we get a lot of mongoose. Um, they can, you know, they will go into water to raid nests. Um, I, you, it's weird because I never saw them before, but with this past rain, the big rain, the first big rain we had earlier this year, um, there was a family of them. And because we, yeah. we got halikoa in the back too on the side. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're usually just stay over there. But I don't know if the chickens are chasing them out or if the rain brought them, you know, 
to the water, but there was a whole family of three oh, that were right along the edge. Yeah, at yeah. the beginning of it. Yeah, I know. I yeah. yeah I just saw one yesterday, but I haven't seen a lot. I haven't seen the family again. So, <laughs> keeping my fingers crossed for those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So we've got, I think, next species that we do see occasionally, definitely not in as, as big a numbers as the Alai Ula. We have the Alai Keo Keo. And um, Sana was putting the slideshow together, and the adult picture really stood out to me because of the red on the forehead. So I'm going to ask Lindsay to talk about a little bit about this bird and its prevalence along the marsh, but also why has this one got a red forehead? <laughs> well, that's a great question, and I'm not sure we can really tell you the answer. Um, so most alaikeokeo keo in Hawaii, they're, um, so basically their, their bill is white, and then the shield, which is this, um, you know, hard part of their forehead connected to the bill is usually white. Um, but a small proportion of alaikeokeo keo in Hawaii have a red shield. Um, you know, we're not sure sure why, if it's, you know, that's attractive to other Alaikeo Keo and there's, you know, selection, there are sexual selection to, to maintain that trait in the population. Um, we're not really sure, but people are interested in it definitely because it's, you know, striking. Um, and so, yeah, keep your eyes out um, when you do see Alaikeo Keo and um, you'll start to notice that um, a percentage of them do have the red shield. Um, yeah, so like okay, at least along the levee at our project site uh, with HOK, like Kristen said, they're not super prevalent. We have maybe one pair. Um, I've never had, I've never seen them nest um, along the levee, although it seems like decent habitat for them. Um, their nest is fairly similar to Aleula in that it's, you know, kind of a built up platform of reeds and grasses. Um, their eggs also look fairly similar. Um, the Alaikeo Keo eggs tend to be, I, I guess I describe them as being covered in freckles, um, whereas the Aleula eggs are kind of freckles and moles and blotches of all sizes. Um, Alaikeo Keo, Keo nests tend to be more um, robust. Um, they tend to be built up a lot more than Aleula nests. Um, yeah, the chicks, when they hatch, they actually, they look pretty similar to, to Aleula chicks. They are more blonde, which is kind of interesting. And that the, the blonde um, kind of mane, if you will, um, disappears a few weeks after hatching. Like Aleula, they are uh, precocial, so they can swim um, pretty much immediately after hatching. It takes them quite a while to be able to fly, um, I think about seven weeks until they can fly. Um, yeah, so they are like Aleula, the chicks are very vulnerable um, to predators. They can do pretty well if they're in the water, but if a terrestrial predator like a mongoose um, finds them on land, they, you know, they're pretty helpless. Yeah, any questions? I do. Um, yeah. So you were saying earlier, the, the Aleula are known to be pretty stationary, sedentary, they've got a typically a really small range, like maybe even less than an acre is at least what we've noticed at our Heia project where we've had a few pairs um, yeah. with successful nests and they don't really leave like that acre project site. But, and, and they don't typically fly or they fly, but it's like across the stream, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but the coots, they, are they more, I, I don't want to call them migratory, but more prone to like taking flight and a bigger range? Definitely. Um, they do. It's interesting because like Aleula, they're not great flyers. They need a, um, a fairly large area of open water and they kind of run along the water and they're flapping and they're flapping and they're just looking really heavy and eventually they're able to fly. Um, but despite that, they, they do move around um, both, you know, all over Oahu. They've actually, um, they fly to other islands. Um, so there have been genetic studies. Um, basically, if a population stays on an island 
for a long enough time and there's a population on an adjacent island, um, you can start to tell genetically that those populations are isolated, like their, their genes start to become different. Um, but looking at coots, uh, you know, throughout Hawaii, we can't really tell that they're genetically different, which suggests that they're moving um, among different islands or between islands. And we've also, you know, we banned, um, we being biologists uh, across the state, banned coots. And we've had instances where a coot that we know was banded on Oahu moves to a different island, which is pretty interesting. And then, you know, just um, in, in Windward Oahu, for example, I think it was 2019, um, the biologist from Marine Corps base started just calling everyone saying, I have, suddenly I have 200 coots. Like, where did these coots come from? Did you, like, Lindsay at Koinui, did you lose coots? Um, so it was kind of this mystery of, you know, the coots just showed up. <laughs> um, so they definitely do move around. Um, and I've noticed that just in my surveys, you know, one week I'll see five and the next week I'll see 30. Um, typically when they're nesting, at least from what I've seen, they, they are a little more sedentary just because they're tending the nest. Um, but, you know, in the summer when there's less water, they're maybe moving around among wetlands to, to find food or, um, yeah, things like that. So. so, and then the next bird that we do see at Koi Nui is very mobile throughout the day. Um, it's really awesome to see these, these birds flying and you can often hear them long before you can see them when they're flying. Um, uh, yeah. I'm, yeah, do you wanna talk about the, and these two look like they're actually banded. They are, yeah. Um, so most birds we would, we band right above the, the foot. Um, stilts because their legs are so long and because um, their feet are often in water. We band um, above, it's actually their ankle, but it looks like their knee. Um, so we band them above. Uh, unfortunately, because of the, the habitat they live in, you know, kind of mud flat and often uh, fairly turbid or dirty water, their bands just get covered in silt and mud. And we put these nice color bands on them so we can hopefully identify them. You know, each bird gets a, a unique combination of color bands that is coordinated statewide. So if I'm putting bands on an IO, no one else in the state has used that combination of colors. And then I report it to the, the state banding, um, bird banding coordinator, and she says no one else used that combo because Lindsay has banded a still at Kawinui with that combo. Um, so in an ideal world, if the bands stayed clean, anyone in the state would be able to, um, to see that bird. So if that bird shows up on Kauai, someone knows that it came from Kauai Nui. Um, so it's, it's often once the bands are old and dirty, it's a fair bit of work to sit there with a spotting scope or binoculars and try to read the bands. Um, yeah, and so like Kristen said, you know, day and actually night too, you'll hear IO flying over. Um, a study was done a few years ago um, where they put uh, radio transmitters on IO and looked at just how much they moved throughout the day. And they were definitely, um, individual birds had distinct patterns of movement. So, you know, maybe they'd roost in May, this is, this study was primarily done um, in Pearl Harbor wetlands. So maybe they'd go roost in mangroves and then they'd wake up and fly to this soccer field and then they'd go to, um, to the uh, National Wildlife Refuge in Pearl Harbor and then go somewhere else. It was like, they're just making their little circuit. Um, the same study that looked at the coot genetics also looked at stilt genetics and found the same thing that there isn't evidence of genetic structure among islands. So basically stilts in Hawaii are, are moving around and interbreeding enough among islands that um, yeah, there, there aren't differences in genetics um, among the, the islands. Um, so yeah, they can move between islands. Uh, what, we had a comment in the chat. Yeah, 
Yeah, I have, um, hey, I am a bird nerd and I have the Audubon calls on my phone. So give me a few minutes while maybe Lindsay talks about the nest and I can see if I can pull those calls up, we can play them really quickly. Perfect. Um, so the nest, um, I owe nesting season is my favorite time of year. Um, unlike the two ally species, uh, they have a very defined nesting season. And that is this time of year when um, the water starts to dry out. Um, so as water recedes, uh, it creates mudflat habitat, which is where I own nest. And this nest in this photo is actually, I'd say a pretty good I own nest. Sometimes they will literally just lay eggs on the ground. Um, so we, we tend to, we call IO nests scrapes instead of nests because they'll often like do a little bit of scraping with their feet and kind of make an area for the eggs so they don't roll away. Um, but they, they often don't, you know, carry twigs or grasses to make their nest in the same way that Aleula and Alekeokeo do. Um, but they do, they sometimes, sometimes they do. Um, they lay three to five eggs. Most of the time they lay four. Um, the chicks hatch after about 24 days generally. Um, and they are also precocial, so they can run around pretty much immediately after hatching. And they also can swim pretty soon after hatching. Um, but for the first week or so, you rarely see them. They'll just sit like these two in the um, photo on the bottom right of the screen. and and hide. Um, I mean, probably that's because I'm in the area. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's kind of their defensive strategy is just to, to hide. And you can see if they were here, they're in um, some little thin bristolous uh, seedlings. But if they were in mud flat, you know, with, you know, some dead vegetation, they would they blend in very well. So when I'm walking in a wetland in you know, this time of year, April, May, June, July, I'm being incredibly careful about where I'm putting my feet. Each, each step is calculated. <laughs> you know, I check, okay, I'm putting my foot there. There's no chicks, no eggs, um, because then the, the eggs are also very cryptic. They're kind of brown splotch, green and brown splotches. And they, I actually just found the first nest in Koinui, the least that I know of, um, this past week. And I knew there was a nest in that area because the birds were acting very suspicious. And I literally, I walked right by it, turned around. I was like, it has to be back over there. And then was like, okay, now I see it. So they're, they're very cryptic, even to trained eyes. Um, yeah, any questions? Okay, I do have, I have the bird calls. Um, okay. So the, the Audubon Society has their native bird book and, um, I'm not sure about the newer version, but the older version that I have it came with the option of a CD also. So I've got them now on my iTunes playlist. So let me know if you guys can hear this. This is the IO call. So kind of a loud, screechy bark. It sounds like um, one of those little wind up dog toys, like a little wind up dog that used to like flip. It reminds me of that. Um, so I, oh, let's get the Ali. So here's Ali Ula. different types of calls and then occasionally they they kind of laugh too I don't know if we've got that one no no laugh it's sometimes it's a faster that starts off high and kind of tapers down I don't want to try to imitate it <laughs> and then a like keo keo
very similar, but a little bit, maybe a little high, more high pitched. And that, that's what we have from Audubon. <laughs> Thanks, Audubon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do we have up next? I guess I have uh, one more thing that I didn't say. Okay. Yes. Um, right. So possibly because gallinules are more sedentary and don't move between islands, um, they're only found on Oahu and Kauai at this point. Historically, they were found on the other islands as well, but they've been extirpated, you know, due to hunting or um, introduced predators or loss of habitat. And because they, they don't move around much, they haven't colonized, you know, Big Island or, or Maui again. Very interesting. Yeah. So our next slide is about some non-native animal. And these, um, these are kind of just the ones that we've been noticing the last few months we've been working um, in the marsh. Um, but I just, we already talked about the nasty mongoose. Um, but what do these non-native animals do like to, what, to the birds and such? Um, that is a good question. Um, I don't really, I don't know too much about rice paddy eels, um, but the other two, Chinese catfish and apple snails, um, we think uh, are like counterproductive to water quality. So they're both uh, bottom feeders and they're stirring up uh, the, the substrate of the water and increasing turbidity. So increasing the amount of, you know, suspended dirt particles that are in the water. Um, the water birds do eat apple snails. Um, so, you know, that is potentially something that makes them not so bad, probably mostly eat the smaller ones. Um, but probably the, um, the decreases in water quality aren't great for birds. Um, yeah, we really wanted to include this slide because when we're working out along the levee, um, we do get a lot of questions about the pink. People are like, what's the pink? What's the pink? Um, and that, those are the apple snail eggs. And it's, it's pretty interesting to see the size of the apple snails too. We've found some that are, I mean, not quite as big as your fist, but there's some pretty big ones out there and they are, there's a lot of them too. Um, yeah. And I, Go ahead. Go. <laughs> no, I was just, I was going to move on to another animal. Oh, I was just going to say, you guys, you don't have apple snails at Hei, right? We don't. So our protocol between sites is um, something that we have to be really, really aware of. So we have different sets of, of buckets when we're using, we use the same black same type of black buckets for our weed buckets and to move the the invasive species that are being pulled out. So we have separate sets of tools for the different project sites because we apple snail can be really detrimental to um, to Loikalo, which is quite a big portion of the restoration work that's going on in the Heia Malka areas. So we do not want to be the conduit for apple snails to be introduced into that area. So separate sets of tools and then really um, being careful to wash our boots and our waders that do go back and forth between sites, being very careful to wash those after our events as well. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, as we think about ways to do larger scale restoration in Kauai Nui, um, one of the things that comes to my mind is to start doing more Loikalo just because it's a way to create really good habitat for water birds in a way that's motivating for people. Um, so, you know, we've had, with HOK, we've had plenty of volunteers come out who are, who are very motivated just in terms of, you know, creating habitat for native species. But when you throw, you know, food into the equation, into the equation um, I think that's motivating to, you know, even a larger um, audience. Um, but in Koei Nui, we're, you know, the apple snail problem is is going to be significant, um, so it's probably probably just going to be a lot of hand picking them from from low E. Um, so it's going to be 
I yeah, and I haven't I haven't checked in too much recently with um, the folks that are working over by Ulupo because they do have a lot of lo'i there and they've had some successful um, oh, yeah. bird nests already this year. Um, so I'm not sure if the apple snails are, are as big of an issue maybe in their area even. It huh. could be. Is it, they do have pretty successful... They do, yeah, it's interesting. I'll have to, to talk with them about that, like whether they're just able to control them by grabbing them when they see them or crushing um, eggs when they see them. Mm -hmm. um, I know they did find um, a pretty interesting species recently. Do, we, do you want to talk about that, Lindsay? Or, um, uh, I think Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so they found, you're talking about the social turtle. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's a, there are two species of turtle in Kawinui, both um, non-native. Uh, yeah, the Chinese softshell turtle, um, they're just, they're the strangest looking animal you've ever seen. <laughs> um, very, very long pointy noses on the turtles. Yeah, we don't see them very often, um, but they're definitely out there. We don't have any evidence that they eat water bird eggs or chicks, but they probably could. They're carnivorous and most animals that have any inclination for eating animals will eat eggs and chicks just because they're so easy to catch. Um, like, well, on the mainland, actually, you know, people have found that uh, white-tailed deer will eat eggs, <laughs> um, so songbird eggs, so smaller eggs, but you know, even something we think of as totally herbivorous will eat eggs if given the chance because, you know, they're a source of protein and nutrients and they're just sitting there. Um, so, yeah, that's my... And then there's also the red-eared slider. Yeah, turtles. that's the other species of turtle, um, which my coworker, Dofa's other wellland biologist, did his master's thesis on red-eared slider diet. So he caught a bunch of red-eared sliders in Koinui and dissected them. And he didn't find any anything in their stomachs to suggest that they were eating water bird eggs. Um, but it's an interesting thing about diet studies. Like if, you know, so if, if, a, if a turtle eats eggs once per year, um, that's still, you know, harmful, but you, the, your chances of finding eggs in a stomach, in a stomach, if it's, not a very common diet item, they're pretty much zero. Whereas if you're watching the nest, you're more likely to get a, a good sense of with, you know, which what we're doing with cameras, we're watching the nest, you're more likely to get a good sense of what's actually eating eggs. So that's been our approach rather than just dissecting all the animals is to watch nests and see what comes because we, we think we have a higher probability of figuring it out. And um, I, see, I see your hand raised, yeah. Yeah, and I so just had a question about that uh, soft shell turtle. So um, it's really weird that you brought it up because last month I looked out in our street and there, I saw this thing on the road and I thought it was a, a dove that was, you know, injured or something. And I walked out and it was a, a turtle and he was about, about yay big. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, right in the middle, so I mean, the car would just come and, you know, smash him. I mean, he, I don't think he could get away that fast. Although he did move pretty fast, I was kind of surprised. Um, so I called my husband and he had, had run out of a, a car. So so I guess we didn't do a good thing by throwing him back in the, into the water. Um, no, and technically, in terms of state law, it's once we, so we have this list of species that are classified as injurious wildlife. Ah. Um, and so technically, if you do have uh, a species that is non-native in your possession, you're technically not, it's technically illegal. No, sorry. To release <laughs> it back into the wild. So well, if you you're- know, The thing is, I've seen them, we've, we see them, every now and then poke their, you know, their heads up and every now and then come up on the bank to sun themselves. But yeah. um, we've never gotten up close and personal to one. So we didn't, in fact, my husband didn't even know that it had a soft shell yeah. until he tried to pick it up and he He's went, like, oh. oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I think um, if you're, if you're concerned about that law, you can call the, um, it's like something and then I ain't pest. telling anybody. 
No, no, I know. It's not like <laughs> you're not going to get in trouble for it. I'm just, okay. you know, well, what, so we you what we have to tell people is that you're supposed to dispose of it. Um, and there is How? a phone number you can call. Oh. Um, okay. Maybe I'll look it up and we can post it or something. It's some, it's three numbers and then pest. I think it's department oh. of ag or something like that to report okay. pest species. And okay. my understanding is someone will come and take, take care of it for you. Oh, I, I've never seen anything about turtles being bad. So I, yeah, I and mean, because I, we see it all the time, I've seen them for years back there, like 20 years they've been back there. Yeah, no, I think in the grand scheme of bad, they're like on the way the less end. bad side. Okay. Um, right. like, I, like I said, we don't have any evidence that they're bad, but they could be. Could be. So, yeah, okay. in, in the grand scheme of, you know, mongoose yeah, yeah. is probably one of the worst. Yeah. Um, okay. They're they're probably not so bad. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. And the number I do have the number, so it's six four three pest. Six four three pest. Um, okay. And so, yeah, I think that's a great thing to bring up. If you know, if we're seeing things, or you have a non-native animal in your possession, then yeah, it would be it would be great to to call that number and to have it released. And I think. So many times people, you know, have a red-eared side or a turtle as a pet and they're, uh, they're done with it, they're over it. Don't, you can't put, don't put that out. Don't put that, like, don't release it into the marsh thinking like, Where oh, do they gonna... put it? You Where... can, I, I believe you can take it back to any pet store and just relinquish your animal to the pet store. You can take it to the Humane Society or you can call the 643 pest number. Okay, thank you. And um, yeah, I just kind of put up with, with um, the eel uh, because um, we had a, and just a Facebook post going around thinking that there was a snake in the marsh. And um, I think it looked pretty much like an eel. What do you think, uh, Kristen? I, I think the report, um, was definitely an interesting report with a very blurry photo of an alku eating something that was shiny, slimy, wriggling looking. And in all likelihood, I don't want to totally discount what they saw. Um, and I know that they reported it and there was some inquiry into the area to see if they could identify or see any snakes or evidence of snakes. But in all likelihood, it was probably one of the rice paddy eels or also called freshwater eel. Um, because we are seeing these fairly often when we're out doing work and they can move across areas that are not water. So they can become terrestrial for short periods of time um, to move between open patches of water. So it's, it's likely with the way that an alku'u would stand and stare and wait that it would find the right time to be able to pick up one of these eels. Um, and definitely we have a, a we have some video of one as well and it moves like a snake it's you know being held by by one of the staff the dofa staff out there and it, it moves like a snake and i could definitely see how someone might think it was a snake but there are rice paddy eels and the chinese catfish are also becoming um i, I we're becoming more used to them when we're out there working because once we start to churn up the water and we're in there working a bit more, they start to come to the surface and you can see their, you see their little whiskers starting to break the surface of the water and they'll flap through our legs. So it's something that we're definitely seeing a lot of those catfish in the area too. So interesting, interesting animals that are out there. Yeah, and then definitely. I wanted to point out also, Lindsay was um, talking about watching the nest. So the picture of the mongoose is from one of their cameras, I guess, trail cameras or action cameras that, that are watching the nest. Yeah, and you can see the water surrounding the nest. So I can't remember, that water was probably four or five inches deep. So you can imagine the mongoose possibly just like walking through it, kind of jumping. Um, but they, they have been known to swim as well. Um, Yeah, and that, that photo is also from one of those cameras, uh, right? Those that uh, you were talking about, the nesting cameras? Yeah, yeah. We have a big study going on where we're putting out a lot of cameras. And then 
we're actually also, so the eggs are definitely prone to disappearing before they hatch, but so are chicks. Like we are, we're not observing very high fledging success, um, which fledging success is what we call basically a, a chick going from, or an, an, a chick going from hatching to being independent of its parents and able to fly. Um, so we, we don't see many chicks, chicks make it. Um, so how we study that is to put um, what's called a radio transmitter on a chick. And then we go out um, with an antenna and basically we can find it because it's emitting um, some radio frequency that, that allows us to locate it. Um, and by doing that, if we do find a carcass, we often can tell why it died or we can submit it for a necropsy. Um, which is like an autopsy for animals. Um, and so, yeah, we're trying to figure out what is eating them or, you know, is it disease or starvation? Basically, why are we seeing this low fledging success? That's, that's very cool. Okay, so um, it, do you, does anyone have any more questions about before we're moving on about any of the animals or plants? And okay, then, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. No, I don't have great. a question. I just have a request. Could you go back to uh, the first pictures of the non-invasive plants? I just want to take a screenshot because I want to show it to my, um, my friends when we walk in the marsh. The native um, plants or the other ones? The, non, the, non in, the invasive ones, the invasive ones, okay. that one, okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, no, because no, I have friends that take pictures all the time when we walk and they're like over the moon when the hyacinths bloom, you know, and, you know, I was telling them, I said, they're really pretty, but I don't know if they're good, you know, so I'm going to tell them now they're no good. So <laughs> I've, I've been having also conversations about the mangrove that was cleared out which I said is no good. And there's this one lady is telling me that it's really good, you know, and I don't know why they're taking it away. And, but then I was reading about the mangroves like in Florida and stuff. So, and, and uh, I can't remember what other islands, but in certain places, they want the mangrove. The mangrove is good for their environment, but I was just trying to explain and I wasn't getting through that. It's not good over here, so. Mahalo. I'm yeah, I can, that. I'll touch on that really quickly while Sana goes to the next slide about how to get involved with us. Um, so we're working out on the marsh every other Friday. And then in those in-between weeks, we're at Kauai Nui Neighborhood Park working in the Kaha Garden Project. So usually every Friday, we're somewhere around that area for the morning and into the afternoon as well, if we're working out on the marsh. So if you happen to come out on a Friday morning and see us or want to come and talk to us, please definitely stop by and say hi and we can um, answer questions there as well. With the mangrove, it's a really interesting it's a really interesting species to be working on in a restoration point of view in Hawaii because it is a protected species in the Caribbean and in Florida and people and in the Gulf are raised to protect mangrove. Um, even in other parts of the South Pacific, mangrove is actively being planted to help protect coastlines from sea level rise and erosion along street, along um, along the shoreline. But in Hawaii, we've got, you know, 12 months out of the year, this beautiful glowing, growing cycle that mangrove, the same species of mangrove that grow in the Gulf are growing here. And what grows to be 20 feet tall in the Gulf or the Caribbean is growing to be 60 to 80 feet tall in Hawaii. And so it's growing totally different than it does in other parts of the world. And additionally, we, it's doing a really good job at erosion control, but it's doing such a good job that it's choking our stream systems and choking the mouth of the stream systems out. So our main work for Huioko Laupoko at our Heia Estuary Restoration Project has been mangrove removal in an effort to open the stream channel again. 
and to take that the dense root mass of the mangrove out of the stream system so that oopu and other native fish can start to utilize the stream system again and you know heia when you look at that heia area that bridge that you cross over um, right before the state park that all used to be water under the bridge and it's it's 50 feet of sediment built up since the time that mangrove were first introduced to that area in the 1940s so it's done too good of a job at collecting sediment in that area um, and as we've removed mangrove at Heia, just like we've seen at Kauai Nui and along the waterway pictured here, as that mangrove has been removed, we've seen a lot more native species come back and start to use those native wetland birds, come back and utilize the area and build their nests. Um, and the native fish too, we've been doing fish surveys at our Heia project, seeing a lot more native fish populations come back into the area too. So that's my two cents on mangrove. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> Sana's email is there, volunteer at huihuai.org if you, anyone's interested in RSVPing to come out and get into the mud with us and come out and play. We are there every other Friday and on the fourth Saturday of the month as well. But of course, always come by and just say hi and pop your head in and visit with us for a little bit too. I think before we go, Sana has a, a quick video on the next slide of, um, let's play, let's just play the time lapse maybe, Sana. And then Mary Beth actually asked one more question. She said, where is, so Sana, if you wanna play the, sorry, Go ahead and play that video and then we've got one more question for Lindsay. Um, where is the best place along the levee to see the most native birds? If you got to get the bang, most bang for your buck, um, Mary Beth's wondering what's the best spot to do some viewing. Um, so I wasn't sure if she was referring to, I mentioned Hamakua Marsh uh, early on. Um, so that's not along the levee, but uh, if you go, probably one of the best places is if you go kind of uh, the Firestone parking lot or kind of um, by that physical therapy office and where like down to earth used to be, um, kind of in the parking lot, the back of the parking lot, you can look into Hamakua Marsh and it's just teeming with, um, with native birds. Uh, so all three species that we talked about today, you can see there. Um, or you can stand on the, the bridge uh, just past Firestone too, if you want a little more, little less uh, parking lot <laughs> view. Um, but along the levee, actually in uh, the first area that we're working, we're, we're just calling it area one until it has a better name. Um, there's two Aleula pairs that are pretty reliably there. Um, so if you're walking on the levee, um, I forget what the, the marker along the levee is, but it's it's near. So if you walk from Kaha Park uh, and you're walking, walking, walking toward Kailua Road, um, and you're looking at the stream, there's an a, uh, an inlet on the the Kailua side, and it's right around that first inlet. Um, that that's that's kind of our our first area. Yeah, Sana, Actually, can you flip back to the map really the map, quickly? That might be helpful. <laughs> Also right down near Kaha Garden or Kauai Nui Neighborhood Park, um, where a lot of people feed ducks with their kids, there's usually a pair or an individual or two that are in that area hanging out with the ducks. Um, yeah, definitely. So just off the side, just off the left side of the map, you can see the very um, end of the soccer field and the park and there's one inlet there and at the next inlet along the red is the is our site one where we've been working so okay, I was wrong it's the second inlet. <laughs> second inlet I know I forget about that first one too yeah and then Kule, you must live along one of those four inlets right there as well yeah I live on the fourth one you see, oh okay you see the blue roof the blue the blue uh -huh. roof that's my house. Oh, wonderful. Cool. Yeah. Um, I had, I had um, a question about, um, I don't know if it was the umbrella sedge. That's the one that comes out like that and kind of like goes like that. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's like, not it can papyrus. Get really tall. That's not papyrus. It is there papyrus out there? There is. Yeah. If you, and if you look at a satellite image of Koinui, you can There's see circles, these. Like, right? Yeah, it looks really strange, but yeah. And if you look over time, they're just they're getting bigger and bigger and I, bigger. Yeah, I I I saw that first when I went to um, uh, Havahini na Napohaku Havahini, yeah. yeah, and looked down into the mm-hmm. and I I was wondering what that was, but that's not related to the umbrella sedge. It's totally different. It's it's related, um, but it's not. It's a different. Species. It's not the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the the papyrus is much more of a poof ball on top, whereas the umbrella sedge just kind of has the little yeah leaf leaflets okay. coming off of it. Okay. I I thought because we have a a small pond in in the front yard and the those things have been coming out and I, all this time I thought it was this the papyrus like that, but I think it's the umbrella sedge because it's it's more like, yeah, like that than a ball. Yeah, yeah, the umbrella says ha- has more like kind of leaves. Leaves. Yeah. yeah, whereas the papyrus, they're actually, they're really thin. I mean, they're still, they're leaves, but right. they're, they're much thinner. Yeah, okay. I want to thank you ladies for all your hard work um, and for all this information. Um, living on the marsh, um, well, well, we had, we were here for the flood of 88, so we had part of the marsh in our house. Um, <laughs> but um, it's it's a beautiful um, resource and I love seeing the birds all the time. Yeah, um, so we're really fortunate to, to have this back here and I hope it stays clear and doesn't, I mean, I keep hearing about them wanting to, you know, build bridges and stuff and I don't want anybody, you know, <laughs> but, um, it's, uh, I, I try to make use of the, the, the walkway, uh, which we are very grateful for that, it, you know, the levee was put up after the, you know, raised more for, after the flood. Um, so I, you know, I congratulate you guys on your hard work. Um, uh, it's, it's looking real good out there um, for when, when the marsh, when they cleared away the mangrove uh, a couple years ago, prior to that, we, we couldn't see the dike wall. We couldn't see the levee wall where we used to be able to see that like 30 years ago and we couldn't believe how high the mangrove grew i mean and so that's why i was telling my friends that when it came down that was a good thing because it was choking you know everything um so thank you for backing me up <laughs> um, thank you thank for you. all your questions today yeah. i made it fun thank you Wonderful. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone for joining us today, Um, whether you are joining us on Zoom or on the Facebook. um, We've got some questions coming in on the Facebook too, so I'm going to go and answer those. And as always, feel free to reach out and contact us via email if you have any questions. Um, We've got our calendar up on our website of events during the week and on the weekends also, including some events coming up for Earth Day and Earth Week and Earth Month. Um, and I want to thank Sana for working on putting this presentation together. And of course, to Lindsay for joining us today and answering all of our questions. Um, yeah, glad to be here. Sana, you want to wrap us up? Yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, and as Kristen was saying, if you ever want to join us, feel free to um, email me. We are limiting our group sizes right now. Um, so just find a day and email me and I'll get back to you. Um, and just a quick, don't be afraid of all that, like be deep in water. We have, we have some extra waders and rubber boots. If you want to join us, you don't have to bring your own stuff and all our stuff is clean and sanitized. So yeah, come out and join us. Or as Kristen said, if you're just walking the levee and see us, say hi. Um, we always, we always like to see people out there so thank you guys and this will be recorded and on our youtube channel i had one more question about the chickens are the chickens at kaha park good or bad for what you guys are doing i mean are they okay uh they're they're 
pain in the butt. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, I just went walking um, the other day and one of the ladies noticed that um, one of the chicken's tail feathers was like torn out. Um, so we didn't know if like dogs were getting at them. So I was just wondering about the, you know, the chicken population, if it was, because I know they're, they're having, there's lots of chicks out there right now. The chicken population at Kwainu Neighborhood Park in Kaha Garden is booming right now. And yeah. they, um, they are not friends to the native plants in the area. Yeah. They, they like to dig up those native plants. And unfortunately, um, that park is prone to animals being abandoned. So I have a feeling mm. that that's okay. how some of those animals got there. We've found other um, silky chickens and, you know, fancy chickens, yeah. and even rabbits at the garden before. So unfortunately, that's, you know, just how it goes. Sometimes People. animals get dropped okay. off and I think Kailua's definitely got a big chicken population. So um, I'm not a huge fan of them, but I know that some of the homeowners there have contacted the city to see if the city can help in removing or rehoming those chickens there. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right, everybody, thank you so much. This will be recording will be posted onto our YouTube channel in the next few weeks. And if you're curious to look back um, on our education and outreach series, we've got a lot of other videos posted uh, since October. And a lot of those have to do with propagation of native plants as well. But we'll be exploring some of our other project sites over the next couple of months and possibly even doing a laymaking tutorial next week for May. Uh, not next week, sorry, next month in May. Um, so keep an eye on our newsletter and we will be sure to announce those in our newsletter and on social media too. So thank you, everybody. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank Have you everyone. Weekend.